You're listening to the Author Stories Podcast. Bringing you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Margaret Wyatt, Terry Brooks, Sheena Kamal, Matthew Quick, JT Ellison, Walt D. Williams, Brad Ford, Corey, Dr. O, Brandon Sanders, Robin Mock, Ernest Klein, Jim Butcher, Sherwin Harris. Visit hankgarner.com for archives of all the shows. Today's guest is. Well, thanks for joining me again for the Author Stories Podcast, where I bring you the story behind the stories and the storytellers. Today, I'm really excited to have Brad Taylor back on the show today to talk about the 15th Pike Logan thriller. It's called American Trader, and uh, I'm so happy when a new Brad Taylor book comes out. And uh, this book, I'll tell you what, Brad, um, I, I don't know how you did it, but you absolutely topped everything that you've done so far with this book. What an amazing, uh, what an, an, an amazing, fun thrill ride it was. Uh, so uh, thank you for that. Uh, welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks for the accolades. That means a lot. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Brad, I was thinking about um, what to, uh, what to begin our conversation with today. And uh, d- do you remember what, uh, b- because you have such a, a long and storied uh, career, with the um uh with the US Army and uh in special forces. Um but do you remember the first fictional work that that you picked up that you read that gave you the sense um that that if you weren't literally there um that this could transport you uh and, and that that the storyteller was doing it right. Uh sure actually it'd probably be uh Ray Bradbury, something wicked this way comes. Uh, I was a voracious reader as a kid, and I always I thought that was the best title ever. And the uh, the book itself was uh, it, it transports you to another world. Absolutely, um, Ray Bradbury was not what I was expecting, but you're um, you're absolutely right. And uh, he he had a way of just taking you along for the journey with him. Definitely. Yeah. Um, so. This is the 15th um, Pike Logan thriller. Did did you ever uh, envision that uh, that a, a character like Logan would have the legs that he does? No, I never thought I'd have a single book published, <laughs> much less 15. So nobody's more surprised than I am. That's awesome. Um, when you when you start thinking about, you know, a new situation to put uh, Logan into, what are some of the first things that you start thinking of? and? And you know your books are so timely; they they feel like they could be ripped right from the the headlines of what's going on in the world today. How do you start kind of weighing out what what scenarios you're going to come up with? It, it actually comes from uh, there are a lot of slow burn stuff. So I mean, this book's about China and Taiwan, which right. is definitely I mean pressing the bow wave right now. I mean, if you watch the news, China's all over the place. Um, so yes, I'm pressing. No, not really. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But it actually came out, this story came out from, um, I was doing research for Operator Down, which was three books ago, um, in Lesotho, Africa. And that book was about a coup of Lesotho. And so I had to go see the parliamentary buildings and see the police stations and things like that. And we ran by a uh, whole new brand, banking new uh, government facilities, and they had Chinese lettering all over the place. And I asked the guy I was with, I, I mean, I thought the lettering said something like, you know, be sure to wear the har hat or something like that, like you see in America. And I said, well, you know, what's up with the Chinese lettering? And they said, oh, China's building all this. And I said, they're doing what? They're, yeah, they're building it for free. I said, why? Well, they just want to be friendly. And I was like, eh, <laughs> not sure they want to be friends here. They, they're going to get something out of this. And that was my first uh, real world broach into the China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is basically a loan chart organization they're doing around the world. And it started bubbling from there. So it's been about three years. That I started studying the Belt and Road, started studying the Spratly Islands started looking at what China's inroads were doing with the Uyghurs and everywhere else, Hong Kong. And that's, it was kind of a slow burn. It wasn't like a, I'm going to write this now thing. For those that are not familiar with the Belt and Road Initiative, can, can you just give us the, the 50,000 sure. you know, feet view yeah, of what that simple. is? It's, it's a loan shark deal where China is investing in all these co- uh, countries around the world. If you need a port, they'll give you a slow interest loan. If you need this, you need that, they'll pay for it. Uh, and then when you don't pay the loan back, they take the port over uh, or even just invest in a country. For instance, the biggest the, the gray war going on with China and Taiwan right now is 
they want to break, they want to sever every bit of diplomatic recognition Taiwan has. So the Belt and Road Initiative goes into, believe it or not, in the Caribbean island, right, you know, off the coast of America. And they start investing in all these Caribbean islands that have uh, embassies inside Taiwan. But once the investment goes in, then they, those guys, unsurprisingly, disavow Taiwan and pull their embassy out. So it's just their way of doing great work around the world. Well, it's really interesting because, uh, you know, it, it allows them to have presence in places um, without militarily doing so. By, by doing it economically, um, it, it allows them to be places in, you know, uh, their motives may not be, you know, on the up and up, but it, it allows them entryway in, into places they might not uh, get otherwise. Is that definitely? Yeah. Like, well, for instance, Sudan's got a lot of oil. And they were having a major civil war back in the day. Now it's split off in South Sudan and that kind of thing. And Sudan just recognized Israel. It's probably why they're in the news now. But China had a lot to do with that because they were the only people in there were in the country of Sudan because it's just it was a civil war. And they were doing investments there to take the oil out of that place. They're all over the place you would never expect. Lesotho, Africa, I'm telling you, is a country in the center <laughs> of South Africa. When I saw Chinese lettering, I was like, what in the world? So they're doing it all over the world. South America, Caribbean, Africa. They're everywhere. So what what uh, is the rest of the world's response to this? I mean, obviously, countries that are benefiting from their, uh, you know, uh, loan sharking, uh, obviously, they're not putting up much of a, of a front. But it is is this becoming something that that other governments like ours are, you know, might be concerned about? Like, how do they start policing that? Well, definitely. In fact, uh, more so than us, like Australia, China is directly affecting Australia, trying to strangle them. And they've just now figured out that, uh, you know, China has had enormous inroads into Australian infrastructure. For instance, the port of Darwin, which is the northern port, the largest port in the north, is owned by China now. And they're all like, how did this happen? It's because they all, somebody said it was a good deal. I'm going to make a lot of money. And this guy says it's a good deal. That guy says it's a good deal. This guy says it's a good deal. Next thing you know, China owns all this stuff. and It's too late. Right. Wow. Wow. So the 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 geopolitical um, machinations are, are are fodder for for all kinds of stuff. But um, we know that with your characters, with with Pike Logan uh, and, and Jennifer Cahill, um, they're going to intersect this real life story in some interesting ways. One thing that that um, that I found interesting about American Trader is it definitely felt like um, it felt like it could be a standalone thriller. Like if I had never read a Brad Taylor book, I, f I feel like I could pick it up and, and I could just jump into the story. Um, and which is quite a feat for a character with as much history um, as Logan has. Um, first off, you know, when, you know, we were talking earlier about, you know, did you ever foresee that, that Logan would have legs like he does? Um, but it's it's interesting to me when you when you have an author who can bring a character that it longtime readers will will definitely be up to speed, but new readers, it, it, it your in your barrier to entry is very low for new readers. Um, is that something that you that you think about like in the planning of definitely. a of a novel? Like how do you how do you bring no, along definitely. new people so that you keep building the readership? Yeah, that's that's probably the hardest thing to do when writing a series is, first of all, they, all my books are standalone. You mentioned right. American Trader, but you could read any of them completely standalone. And the hardest part is um, I have to give the background of the task force and Jennifer and Pike and everything else for the new reader without boring the hell out of the old reader. So I'm constantly trying to figure out ways, how can I introduce this? And, I, and I've kind of taught myself that, you know, you don't need to blurb all this stuff out in chapter one. Let it leak. And so in American Trader, it does. I mean, and that's basically what happens. You don't find out, you know, about glory recovery services, until I think, chapter six or something. It just kind of leaks out. And the reader doesn't need to know that. And I'm a reader first. So, I mean, I, I'm a voracious reader. And so as I'm writing, I'm writing, OK, what would I like to read? Do I really need to know this piece of information right up front? No, I don't. I'll let it come out later. And the reader will get that. The readers are smart. They'll figure it out. Uh, and so that's what I try to do. And and readers will appreciate um a certain level of of you teasing it out, you know, like like as a reader, I want to feel like I've uh, accomplished something in the reading. I, I don't want right. to be spoon fed. I, I want to feel like that there's a, a certain mystery that I'm I'm allowed to unravel as it goes. 
Yeah, and that's also that's I, I sometimes I get dinged by people saying that I I use military acronyms or this or that or the other, and I, I never use anything that's not explained in the book. But I don't come right out and explain it, as in pause. Here's a PowerPoint slide of what's going on. <laughs> Let's get back to the story. You're going to figure it out in the dialogue. You're going to see what's going on, and you're going to pick up what's going on. Um, so I, I definitely, because um, as a reader myself, I don't like being spoon fed something. You don't need to tell me everything about this. Just give me enough to know what's going on, and I'll figure it out. And maybe I'll figure it out wrong, and then I get a twist, which I enjoy. You know what I mean? So right. I, I, I don't like. Uh, I, I definitely, as a reader, don't like getting spoon fed, and so I definitely don't do that in my books. Well, how many years has it been since you were active duty? Uh, retired in 2010. 2010. Okay, so a decade. Um, it, you know, um, it it might. Um, one way of thinking would be, well, Brad has all of the the inside information, and I'm sure that there's tons and tons of of things that you know about or are privy to um, that you could work into the story and and you know change a little here or there. But the world has changed a lot in the last decade. Um, how do you stay abreast of what's going on and new technologies and, and things like that that might be available to uh, to Logan and his group um, while, you know, staying true to it. But, uh, but how do you stay abreast and, and keep up with things? Well, I, I mean, when I say retired from the military, when I first got out of the military, I mean, I still had to put shoes on my kids' feet. Sure. So I did what everybody else does uh, in my was my skill set. I became a military contractor, a private military contractor. And so I do security contracts all over the place. And that, I mean, that kind of keeps you abreast because every one of them I do is something, whether it's for director of national intelligence, for Wexford, for whoever, there's, you're going to learn something in there that's going on in the world. Uh, I mean, for, for instance, for a while there, the, uh, the pin, they call it the uh, Korean peninsula was the biggest thing in the world. And I was going to write a book about that. And I thought, as I started studying everything and eh, that's not going to go anywhere. And so I didn't. And sure enough, it didn't go anywhere. So it's, <laughs> I just, kind of stay abreast of, of uh, every morning I get feeds from all over the world, open source stuff. Anybody could get them, but I've, I've cultivated these feeds that uh, every morning I spend about two hours reading what's going on in the world. And you don't see what's going on in the world in, uh, you know, NBC Nightly News. It's because it's it's not something that Americans care about, but I care about. It. So I read all these really finite generic things about a terrorist group here or a bombing there or whatever it is. It doesn't make the news, and it, and I kind of stay abreast that way. Well, and uh, you know there are lots of interesting things uh, that that you could write about, and uh, lots of geopolitical goings on um, that, that are fascinating. But if we don't have a character uh, or characters that we care about, um, it, it's hard to to uh, uh, to build a novel series, you know, without great characters. Um, how do you keep finding things to, uh, to challenge Logan and his crew with, um, and you know, what, what are some of the, the personal dramas that we kind of, uh, find ourselves in, in, in book 15? I, I, I completely agree. I think, uh, in fact, I was just asked this, um, by an uh, interview with New York times, I did that, uh, you know, what, what makes a good thriller? And I said, but without any doubt, characters, 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 I could write a scene that would be you know, incredibly complex, a David Jackal type thing. This guy's building a car bomb and he's, you know, he's going to uh, get the whole thing built up and it's in an empty parking lot. Well, the reader doesn't care if it blows a car up in an empty parking lot. He only cares if there's a character that he's invested emotional energy in that's going to be harmed. That's exactly. what he wants to see. And so that's definitely the biggest trying thing. And that's the other thing about a series is the characters have to grow. Now I can, and I've gotten emails saying my antagonists are some of the best written. You know, I really love the antagonists. Kind of sick of Pike. <laughs> okay, well, <laughs> well, the antagonist is he's a one guy in one book. Now, Pike's been over 15 bucks, and, and he's got to grow. He's, he's going to change. Jennifer's going to change. The dynamics of the team are going to change. Uh, life is a human experiment. I mean, when you have a kid, you, your life's changed. When you go to college, your life's changed. People grow. And that's the strongest thing I try to do in the books is make sure these guys are not stagnant. The so Pike Logan from... One Rough Man, my first book, is definitely the different Pike Logan is right now. And right. that's hard to do. Well, and, and having his relationship with Jennifer Cahill and and uh they have a new daughter uh that that they are uh that they have taken on. What do these parts um of of Pike Logan's personality and and his attachments 
What do what do those bring to the story? Bane of my existence. <laughs> so when I write a book, I, I mean, each book, as I said, stand alone, and I give a hundred percent into that one book. There's going to be something. I mean, everything I give is in that one book. I'm not I'm not a good enough author to sit there and think I'm going to sprinkle an Easter egg for book four books down the road, or I'm doing this because I'm going to do something in the next book. And in Daughter of War, which is Amina, the daughter you're talking about, I wrote that purely just as a standalone. You know, this is it was and it's a great book. But then I created Amina. She's got to do something. I can't just have her right <laughs> off of the sunset. Somebody's going to say, what happened to Amina? And um, so then I had to figure out a way to weave her in. And it was kind of coincidental. Uh, I decided that uh, I'd put her in a boarding school um, in Charleston, South Carolina, so they could go off and do their butt kicking around the world. And the boarding school I chose, which is here in Charleston, uh, actually has boarding students. And they're actually, every one of them are Chinese. And I thought, holy moly, that fits into my book. And so I <laughs> ended up using it. Wow. that How fortuitous. Right. <laughs> um. So the the book opens and uh and and Pike and Jennifer are are taking a little downtime. Um, they find themselves in Australia, and you mentioned earlier that uh you know that Australia is having its own um interesting uh you know, run-ins with this um Belt and Road Initiative. Um, did do do those things start coalescing there? They did, and actually, um. This is going to sound trite, but my my wife, we do the book research trips. So I went to Taiwan and Australia and all over the place. She was saying, well, we got to do a book in Australia because I want to dive the Great Barrier Reef. And for <laughs> years, I've been saying there's nothing in Australia. Well, I started focusing on Taiwan and China. And then I ran across this news story in Australia where um, a guy was running for parliament and won a seat into the Australian parliament. He was, uh, you know, second generation Chinese. And he came right out and said, hey, the Chinese MSS, the Ministry of State Security, their CIA, paid me to run, and I won. Well, then they found him dead two days later in a hotel room. And nobody knows, you know, it's not been ruled a homicide, but the guy's dead. And I was like, holy moly, that's something I can use. And so I started researching Australia, and they've just, the Chinese are just going crazy in Australia, all over the place. And so it really fit well in the book. Um. This this interesting relationship between China and Taiwan um, for, uh, you know, my whole adult life, there has been some tension there with um, uh, with Britain, uh, you know, relinquishing their hold on Taiwan and then uh, China. You mean, you mean Hong Kong? Um, Hong Kong. I mean, I'm, I'm sorry. Excuse yeah. me. Um, yeah. And, and this, uh, you know, that they're. For the rest of us around the world, we don't we don't really understand what uh, what the relationship is between these um, these two entities. Um, why is uh, why this this uh, this futile uh, battle between China and, and Taiwan? Well, Hong Kong's a little bit different. So Hong Kong and Macau, Macau was a province of Portugal, and they gave up in 1999, and Hong Kong gave up in 1999 for what they called two states. One system. Uh, I'm sorry, two, yeah, two states, two systems. And so Hong Kong's going to be allowed to do the capitalist stuff they did. Well, last year, the, China made a national security law that says if you said anything bad about China, we're going to arrest you. And now they're kicking Hong Kong's butt left and right. But they, Hong Kong and Macau are definitely parts of China, the Beijing China. Taiwan's completely different. So when Mao Zedong took over the country uh, in 49, all of the nationalists fled to Taiwan. And for the longest time, we recognized Taiwan as the rightful heir of China. We didn't have an embassy in Beijing. We had an embassy in Taipei. Uh, and then Jimmy Carter said, just because of forces of nature, I mean, by the end of the day, China was clearly the 800-pound gorilla, and Taiwan was the flea. Right. He said, we're going to, all right, we recognize Beijing. Everybody else had already done it. And we moved our embassy to Beijing. But we said what's called strategic ambivalence, really is uh, we're going to still defend Taiwan from encroachment on, from China. But we never made a treaty with them. We just made some, uh, there's some laws on the books and, and handshake stuff, but it's not an official treaty. And that's the way it's lasted forever. And um, and we did it for good reasons, because if we said, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we're going to defend Taiwan no matter what, Taiwan would have declared independence, said, we're our own country, get out of here, which would have caused a war. Uh, on the other hand, if we just said, we're abandoning Taiwan, China would have invaded immediately. 
So the strategic ambivalence has worked for the last you know, 50 years, but it's coming to a head now because the president of China has basically said, I'm not going to pass this on to the next generation. We're taking Taiwan. And all the stuff he's doing in the Spratly Islands, the new aircraft carriers he's building and all that kind of stuff, it's kind of bubbling up. And there's arguments on both sides. I won't side with one or the other. I've read a bazillion of them, but people smarter than me to study the problem. One will argue one way and one will argue the other, but it's bubbling up. So, so China, um, and, and, and this plays heavily into the book, um, because they're the, um, these tensions start, start bubbling up. And, uh, what does, how does Pike, um, factor into, uh, to these goings on? Well, one of the things that I started looking at was uh, artificial intelligence. China is one of the other things they said is they're going to be the uh, undisputed king of artificial intelligence by 2035. And they've been stealing our technology all over the place. And artificial intelligence has started to be really being used both in the United States and in uh, China. And I thought there's a twist on that, that if you got if you got Taiwan to attack China, vice China attacking Taiwan, then China would have every right for self-defense. And they could come in, uh, and so I started looking at how I could do that. Well, and there's uh, speaking of technology, there's a, a new technology that factors into the book, um, and, and it's it, we're starting to see a little bit of this rolling out more and more as this idea of deep fakes uh, or, or oh, yeah. videos that are uh, that are changed, and you know when you can. Uh, you know, we've been able to manipulate audio for for quite a while. Uh, it and it's it's one thing to think that you hear something that's not there. It's an entirely different thing when you when you can think that you hear something and see something that's not there, uh, and it looks very real. Um, how is this technology going to um, affect life going forward? Uh, it's going to have a huge effect, both pro and con. The, uh, the ability to manipulate videos. So, you know, the old story used to be, you're going to believe me or your lying eyes. Well, I believe what my eyes see. Well, if what your eyes see is not really real, um, and then that spreads, you know, across social media and everywhere else, it's too late. That lies out there. Right. And it works both ways. There's a thing called, uh, in the, you know, the studies of this, they call it the liar's dividend. So now if somebody, you know, somebody's in a back room and they have a video, secret video recording of this politician saying A, B, C, and D, and that gets out in the wild, that becomes, uh, you know, it's a deep fake, but it becomes real. And everybody believes that this guy's lied about. Well, there's another ancillary to that is if the guy really did say that in the back room and he really is a bad guy and he gets out in the wild. And now he says, well, that's a deep fake. And that's known as a liar's dividend. He says, that's not a real video. And it, now you don't know who to believe. So great. I, I the the ramifications uh, of that are uh, could keep you up at night. I mean, this is scary, scary stuff we're dealing with. Yeah, especially with the way social media works now that, that the uh, rapid uh, when it spreads out across social media, more people see it, more people believe it than don't. Um, then it's it's a done deal. You, you're playing catch up at that point. You have to prove it's a fake video, and the, and the technology is getting so good now that you have to get into the ones and zeros. There are ways that you can find out deep fakes for that are made, like open source stuff. I've made a couple of deep fake videos just doing research for the book, where you can buy or not buy, but it's actually free on GitHub. Get some open source stuff and make a video of yourself. Well, the easiest one to think of is the elf dance, Christmas time. You know, right, right. everybody gets a little elf dance with their head on it. Well, with just a little bit more software power, you could turn that elf into a real thing. It looks real. And um, the, the, if you had a, a state actor who has enormous infrastructure behind him, you can't prove that thing's fake unless you really dissect the ones and zeros. And by the time you do that and then present the evidence that the layman can understand, in other words, an egghead standing up there saying, you know, all this sharp C programming, blah, 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 he's not going to understand that. You need to prove to him that's a fake video. By then, that fake video is embedded in the national consciousness. Um, Brad, there, there's something um, that I love about your books, and your your sense of humor really um, kind of bleeds through onto the page, and and you can tell um, in in your writing of uh, of Pike Logan and the crew um, that uh, that there you you um, how do I say this. Um, 
you, there, there's a, a way that you really ramp up the tension, but then let us off the hook a little bit with some uh, moments of levity um, to where you're you're not being silly and it's not um, it, it's not robbing the the book of its uh, emotional impact. Um, but you allow us to have kind of the full range of emotions. Um, is that something that you ever think about when you're writing? You know, um, I, I need to I need to let the reader off the hook a little bit for just a minute. Let them catch their breath a second. Is, is that something that you think about? I, I don't think about it as as a writer as I'm writing a book. I will say that uh, um, everybody in special operations has an enormous sense of humor. And when I'm writing scenes of the team's doing something, there's just funny stuff that happens, even you know, there's been plenty of times I've been in the best combat unit in the United States military. And, you know, at the end of it, somebody would laugh and say, yeah, best of the best because something stupid happened. <laughs> and the, I mean, they, they always have an enormous sense of humor. And that's what we used to always laugh about Rambo. You know, Rambo is a quintessential special forces guy. Have you ever heard that guy tell a joke? Have you ever even seen him smile? I mean, he's had five <laughs> books and he's never even said a joke. And so we used to always laugh about that and say he'd last about 10 minutes in this unit. That's hilarious. That's hilarious. Well, the new book, American Trader, uh, number 15 in the Pike Logan series, is available everywhere today. Um, you can grab it in Kindle edition or hardcover or audiobook. Um, Brad, what do you, what are you, what's your take on, on audiobooks these days? You know, that, that seems to be the kind of the, the largest growth market in publishing right now. And, um, I, I, I have listened to the last couple of, Pike Logan thrillers on audio and um, it's a different experience. I love it. Yeah, it is. And I, uh, I honestly can't listen to my own books being read because I, in my own <laughs> head, I have my own voice. Right. Uh, and I, I've gone through uh, several different readers over the years and settled on Rich Orloff. He's the best guy that I've found. And um, he's, uh, he's, they, when I went to William Morrow and they said, yeah, who'd you like to read this book? And I said, go ask if Rich is available. Cause he's does a good job at it. And, um, I think that the reader or the, the person reading the book really has the ability to sway what's meant in the book. And so early yeah. on, I had some people where Pike would make a joke. And when the guy read it, it sounded like he was being serious. And I was like, that's a joke. He's not, that's <laughs> not what, he was, what he meant. Um, so for me, it's, it's, it's really hard for me to hear somebody read my book, to be honest with you. Well, um, we'll, however you like to consume books, there's links to it in the show notes of this episode. Um, Brad, if people are just discovering you and want to dig into all the great stuff that you do, where can they find you online? Uh, I'm, the website's bradtaylorbooks.com, and on that website, they can actually get ex excerpts of uh, every book I've written, including the American Trader. The excerpt just went up. Awesome. We'll put links to it in the show notes to make it easy for people to find you. Brad, always fun catching up. Um, love the new book. American Trader is out everywhere now. Uh, we're going to send everyone to see you. Thank you so much for taking time to come back on the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Both Barrels Publishing is the brainchild of successful indie author James P. Sumner. He has self-published over 15 titles in the last five years and has over 800,000 downloads so far in his career meaning he has a wealth of knowledge and experience to share with the indie publishing community. Knowing the struggles of the modern-day indie author as well as he does, he wanted to create a platform that would allow writers of any level to learn the ropes, navigate the pitfalls, and produce a professional novel without wasting time or money in the process. Both Barrels Publishing is the perfect one-stop shop for any indie author, combining James's expertise with his own team of editors and designers so you can help your novel realize its full potential and learn how to publish yourself. The purpose of Both Barrels Publishing is to help indie authors get their novels ready for publication without all the stress, hassle, and unnecessary expense. We want to make your lives easier, which is why we're giving you access to a top-notch team to publish your novels along with a generous discount on their services. You can also work one-on-one -on -one with James to learn the intricacies of self-publishing. No hidden cost, no false promises. We simply want you to publish the best version of your novel. BothBarrelsPublishing.com